Welcome everyone. Feel free to unmute for a minute until we officially begin. I'm glad to see all of you. Thank you for joining me. Good to see you as well. I recognize Teresa's voice, but I don't see you yet. <laughs> Morning, Jane. Hi, hi. Hi, Sue. Hi, Jane. I'm so glad to see you, Michelle. How are you feeling? I'm doing all right. Good. Good. What a treat to see you again. Thank you. We'll give, uh, we'll give people a, a moment to arrive. And um, this is going to be pretty informal. Um, if you're joining me for the first time, welcome. Uh, really glad to see some new faces. And you may notice I have a new face. <laughs> I, uh, my first piece of advice is do not build a puppet theater. <laughs> I was, I, a, week, a week ago, Sunday, I was in the studio with my darling granddaughters and we were putting the finishing touches on a cloth puppet studio that was going to be mounted on a tension rod in a doorway so that they could do puppet shows. And I was so excited to put it in a doorway before their dad got there so we could show off a little that I tripped over it. And I <laughs> hit my head on the concrete. Oh, uh, wow. So Ow. I, I had a big oh, bump my. and I had, I'm still getting over two black eyes. And I tried concealer, which I had to go and buy because I don't own anything like that. And it didn't really work. So... Uh, <laughs> That's a way of leading in to say that um, one of the best things I read this week was a quote from Sarah Blakely, who was the founder of Spanx, which is women's uh, underwear stuff, tights, mm -hmm. stuff like that. And she wrote, I often do things that are embarrassing on purpose. I will actually seek out embarrassing situations so that the fear of embarrassment loses its power over me. And I thought, isn't that a great way to think about practicing yes. embarrassment? Yeah. So you can turn it into a superpower. There you go. Wow. <laughs> that is good. That is good. Yeah. We could have we could have canceled this until I looked more like my usual self. <laughs> There's no nice. guarantee that will ever come back. <laughs> of course it will. It will. It will. So here we are. So I'm delighted to see you and um, you will, now, if you do not mind, I would appreciate it if you would mute yourselves. If you are new to me, um, you're in the right place, I hope. I'm Jane Donawald and I have some things that I think will be entertaining to share with you today. There will be time for questions and answer questions and hopefully answers after the, the brief presentation that I have. Um, and the way that this usually works is that you're welcome to put questions in the chat, but I'm not really great at watching the chat and noticing them. So for those of you who might not be that familiar with Zoom, if you look down under, let's see, now I can't find it myself. Um, you should be able to find a place with a raise hand feature. And when we get to the point of asking questions, if you'll use that raise hand feature, then I can see all of those um, in order. And the way we always, we, we play fair. I have a big judge archetype. I'll talk about that in a minute, but I wanna be fair. And so I think of the raise hand feature a little bit like a talking stick that we pass around uh, as they do in some indigenous cultures so that people who wanna talk have a, a chance and it, it all balances out. But this is also a little bit like herding cats. And that means that if you can't find the raise hand feature, you can just use the blurt feature. And the blurt feature is to unmute yourself and just interrupt me and good luck if you can. So that's how we'll handle the questions at the end, but you're welcome to put questions in chat. And I see that Zena's here and hopefully she'll have a chance to sort of watch the, the chat so that we don't lose track of anything there. And something else Zoom added recently is that if you're not careful and you're putting your hands up in the air a lot or gesticulating a lot, 
the hand feature turns on automatically. And then you, you're, I'll be damned if I know how to turn it off when that happens. So we're all learning together here and I just want it to be fun. And uh, so here we go. And thank you for muting. Um, most of you have already done so. Don't forget to do that as it, uh, you know, one time um, there was a conversation going on that was unmuted and it was a little bit on the embarrassing side. So you wanna protect yourself if there's somebody else in the house and definitely mute until it's time to ask a question so we don't get into any compromising positions. And make sure you've got your clothes on because we're also seeing everybody. And, uh, and, and unless you're so inclined, it would really be better if you're at least half dressed from the waist up like I am. So, okay, here we go. So, Today, I'm talking about several things. Let's see, K, we need to mute K. There we go. It's a lot to get used to, I understand that. So today, I have a, a presentation to share with you. And what I want to talk about is several of the underlying uh, beliefs that I have developed and that Zena has, has developed as we have navigated the waters of creative strength training and creativity in general. And I want to preface all of it by saying that I think it's important that we each recognize that there is such a thing as sacred creativity. And sacred creativity is the stuff that you make or do just for yourself. And I see creativity existing on a continuum. And that means that on one end, there is sacred, pure creativity that you do just for your own satisfaction or enjoyment. And at the other end of the continuum, there's what I think of as commercial creativity. And the point is none of it is good or bad. It all exists. That's why it's on a continuum. And the commercial creativity leads to computers and breakthroughs in science and medical breakthroughs and doing hip replacements, which I'm going to have soon in, a, in an amazing, effective way. And so that kind of creativity, the world would not continue to evolve if we didn't have that kind of creativity. There are people who have creative ventures that involve printing fabric and all kinds of wonderful things that might've started as sacred creativity first, but expanded and became a viable source of income. But the, the, the point that I want to make is that every single one of us has the ability to explore creativity in ways that we have not possibly tapped yet. And what that means is that we have resources that we have yet to discover. But at the core of it is this idea that some of the best creative experience you can have in your life is the kind of creative experience that you would not necessarily share with anyone else. It's for your own satisfaction. It's the process that brings joy into your life that is so significant. And so that's where we begin. But then I, and I do, I'm gonna share, I bring up some slides now. Here we go. So that leads into what I think of as the cornerstones of creativity. And there are four cornerstones in the way that I have envisioned them or imagined them. Other people, there are lots of ways of getting to the same, same place, but this is just how I think about it and how I share when I'm teaching or as a matter of fact, like right now in, in this particular talk. And so the first one is what I think of as curiosity. And each of us is innately curious because as children, we were curious, but sometimes curiosity gets shut down and we just kind of forget about it or we get on another track and we forget to look around and see what an, an incredible, amazing world we live in. And so this image of the child is meant to represent that. Curiosity is what leads you to discover new techniques that you might like to try. Curiosity leads to trying new recipes. And so it isn't really pigeonholed 
in one little area of your creative life, but curiosity definitely leads to expanding, being able to expand, choosing to expand, in fact, your creative experience of your life. The second cornerstone of creativity is clarity. And clarity is important in lots of ways. And sometimes clarity comes to us as younger people. Sometimes clarity doesn't start to come to us until we, we get a few years under our belts. But in general, the way I think about clarity from a creative standpoint is that when you develop some clarity or achieve some clarity, you begin to realize as much about what you don't want to do as you realize about what you do want to do with your time. We all have time that is not negotiable. We all have things that we have to do in order to keep the wheel spinning and the plates in the air. But we each have some amount of time that is our negotiable time. And how we choose to use that time and what we pursue during that time is what helps us to realize what's important to us, what we really love to do. All of that is part of what I think of as alignment, which is when what you want to do and what you, what you spend your time doing are the same thing. Whether you're good at it or not doesn't really matter. Whether you love it is really the important thing. Do you enjoy it? And so that is what I mean when I talk about clarity. The third cornerstone of creativity is confidence. Confidence comes in all shapes and sizes, genders and races, but confidence is what happens. Another word for confidence I think is self-esteem. And when we have a sense of self-esteem, we are pretty clear, clarity has led us to understand what is important to us from a creative perspective. And that just filters down into your whole life perspective, I think. And so here, what we're really talking about is a confidence that isn't necessarily about being real sure how to quilt something or how to paint a particular way. That comes partly from the confidence of believing that you can learn how to do it and that you have got, you, you know, you've got your curiosity in your side pocket and you've got your clarity about what you would like it to look like or you're growing into that. And all of that leads to a certain sort of self-confidence that begins to make you feel as though you're capable. Capable could be one of the cornerstones of creativity, I think, but there are only four legs. The fourth cornerstone of creativity is community. And when you have explored what you are curious about and gotten some clarity around what you are curious about and you begin to develop a certain level of confidence, then if you so choose, you can start thinking about what kind of community you would actively like to be part of. And so there are quilt guilds, there, there are groups of all kinds that function as communities for creative people and as communities for people that are not necessarily focused specifically on creativity. But the point of community is that you feel accepted there. You feel as though it is your tribe. You feel willing to support the other members of the community because you know, in fact, that they're making an effort to the best of their ability to support you. And so those are the cornerstones of, of how I see creative process and activity in our lives. And, you know, I used to think when I was younger that this is just something you figure it all out and boom, it's done. It is. There isn't any problem now. But what I realized is that you can encounter all of this and get to a particular point where things are going along pretty well and then boom, something happens. I got a letter this week from someone who said that ever since her partner died, she has not been able to tap anything creative in her life. And I know she's not the only one. I've heard that lots of times. So there are all kinds of things that can keep us from staying on track with some of what brings us the, the really the greatest joy in our lives. And so I wanna talk a little bit about 
those stumbling blocks and how we get back on track. Because before you know it, you know, when something like that happens, you lose your creativity and your clarity dims and your confidence starts taking a hit. And what do many of us do? We, we just dig a little hole and we get in it. And we do not, we don't make much of an effort to come out. And that is, and I know this from personal experience, that's when you need other people the most. And yet we do it to ourselves all the time. It's a, it, you know, it, it, it can occur in your life. You can probably look back over your own life and see how it has occurred more than one time where that cycle of getting shut down and not knowing how to go forward and losing your confidence and not really knowing. A, a friend said to me one time, Jennifer Martin said one time when I was in that kind of a spot, you have forgotten who you are, Jane. And she didn't mean the famous Jane Dunawald. That means nothing here. She meant the Jane Dunawald that knew to go into the studio and work on some project, any project, even if it was just cleaning up the studio as a way of reconnecting and beginning again. And that's key to what I'm talking about here, the willingness to begin again. So the next step of, of this process that I wanna share with you has been my 20 plus year um, study of archetypes. I was fortunate to find a book called Sacred Contracts by Caroline Mace in I think 2002. And it launched me on a new way of understanding the creative process and understanding how archetypes could actually be a positive force for understanding the stumbling blocks and the things that get in the way of our ability to stay in touch with our creative side. So archetypes are a way of looking at creativity and stumbling blocks. But it's important for people who aren't familiar with them to know a little bit more about them. This was originally a, a concept that was proposed by the Swiss uh, therapist, psychotherapist, psychologist, Carl Jung. And archetypes are neutral patterns. They're not good or bad. People are scared of them because they because of the, the, the names that they have. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But the names only represent a, a way of understanding of, of, of um, it's a shorthand. It's a shorthand for what they are. But the fact is, they're not a religion. They're not related to religion. They're not in any way at odds with whatever your faith is, if you have one. They're useful even if you're an atheist because they're patterns that explain some of how we behave and we recognize them in each other. And when we begin to recognize them in ourselves, then we have an opportunity to learn a particular lesson because I really, really, really feel so strongly that when you can identify a particular issue that you're having, you're halfway along to actually resolving it or solving it in a positive way that might bring back some of your creative joy. So these are just a few and in, you know, there are all kinds of ways of looking at archetypes, but there are a number of contemporary theorists who believe that there are four universal archetypes. The universal archetypes represent lessons that we all have to learn as human beings. And so, for example, first off here is the saboteur. And I just want to point out that someone sabotaged her t-shirt because it's spelled wrong. <laughs> and I don't know, AI generates surprising combinations. Um, but the fact of the matter is that we're all, of, of, of all of the universal archetypes, these four that you can be familiar with, most of us are painfully aware of the saboteur. We have sabotaged ourselves. We have been in situations where unfortunately other people sabotaged us because of comments that they made that we took personally. You know, the classic comments that shut people down are things like, well, 
you didn't go to art school or you're getting a late start in life or um, how long did that take? And do you think you're going to be able to sell that or what are you going to do with it? All of those comments are comments that creep into our heads and sabotage us. But the positive lesson of the saboteur, because the saboteur, you know, these four archetypes are frequently referred to as the guardians or the protectors. So if the saboteur is, is one of your protector archetypes, because we all have these four, there's no way around it. It's inevitable. You can say, oh, I, I don't know that one at all. I've never met her. And that is, <laughs> that, that's yet to be determined, frankly. But the point is that the positive lesson of the saboteur is related to the fact that she is the protector of your choice. And that means that she can protect and help you get better at protecting the choices you make so that you won't be sabotaged. And so if you know for a fact that you have a friend, and we all do, people that we love, who are still capable, they don't mean to do it, but they, the slings and arrows that come from them can be very hurtful. And so when they say the kinds of things that I just mentioned, the important thing is that we can choose how we are going to respond to that so that it no longer is about us and we can turn it and realize it's just about them. And we can love them anyway. We can't start getting rid of people because they don't satisfy us or say the right thing all the time. We have to figure out what our system is going to be so that we can distance ourselves from them and recognize that what they're saying is something that, as far as we're concerned, we're going to choose to see it as irrelevant because that's the choice we're going to make to protect our creative selves. Oh, do I wish that we all had this little happy child inside our set of archetypes. We've all got a child and the child's protection is innocence. What the child in you is still there, if you might not have been in touch with her for a long time, but the child in you is there to bring joy to what you do and to help you return to a playful attitude of innocence in the creative work that you do. And you can literally think to yourself, okay, I need my child to come in right now. And uh, my dear friend, Linda Wingrove, who's been studying all of this for a very long time, actually suggests having a dialogue with your archetypes in order to understand better. And this is just a form of free association writing. Write down, okay, child, tell me what you want me to do so that I can get back in touch with my higher creative purpose and self and just write and see what happens. It sounds ridiculous, but it's proven to produce Amazing, uh, maybe that's too big a word, but it, it's proven to, uh, to be a useful way to be in touch with yourself because so much of it is in there and it, we just need these strategies in order to access it. The third universal archetype is the victim. And we've all at least once or twice felt the same way this woman is probably feeling, which is feeling no good, not compared to everybody else, no point in continuing on, why am I even here? The, and here's the thing about archetypes, they don't, these patterns don't act independently of one another. They ride shotgun, they support each other. So if you're on the shadow side of the victim and feeling as though you're no good and what's the point, 
you can be pretty sure the shadow saboteur is also in the room. So you're getting a double whammy. And the, the, the positive lesson of the victim is to recognize once again, when you're in situations, which you may or may not have put yourself in, where you're beginning to feel as though you don't have any power because that's when your self-esteem or your sense of self takes the biggest hit when you don't feel like you have any real power. And this particular archetype, the victim, is the guardian, the protector of your self-esteem. And so when you're actually learning the lesson of the victim, you see clearly when you have allowed yourself. And I must say, there are certain situations that we get into where we are victimized and it, it isn't our fault. So this isn't some woo-woo thing that ma makes it all your responsibility. It's not all your responsibility at all. You can be an experience, you can have experiences where you're the one who's been victimized. And we're all very familiar with those living in the culture that we live in. But from a creative perspective, at least, it's important to see where you've let other people's comments, where you've let all kinds of situations make you feel less than so that you can begin to see. And I know I've seen it happen in CST. There are people in the audience today who came into our community feeling less than. And it's such a privilege when you begin to see that now they feel fine. They feel okay. The last universal archetype is the hardest one. That's why I saved it for the end, not the end, but for the end of this, this part of my talk, is the prostitute. And that's because we can't help. And this is a problem with all of the archetypes. They, they have, you know, we're human beings and we're English, for the most of us, English speaking. And words are charged. There's no way around it. And prostitute is a charged word. Prostitute is related to selling your body for money. But that isn't the only thing that the word means. And two or three years ago, a, a, a member challenged me to change the name. I didn't come up with that name. Caroline Mace came up with that name. But I, I couldn't change it just to fit my program or just to fit my agenda because if we look hard at what a prostitute is, it's somebody who sells out. It doesn't have to have anything to do with sex at all. If you sell out and you don't have faith in the artwork that you make or the recipes that you make, or the, you know, if, if you, this will probably piss somebody off, but if you can't choose a color for your living room, and you have to get somebody else to come and pick the colors for you. In a way, you're kind of selling out to your own creative desire. If you want a red living room, go for it, you know? And so that's really what the prostitute's about. The prostitute is the protector of your faith in yourself. And by extension, the prostitute is the protector of your faith in a higher, higher something whatever that is. We're not all accepting of that idea. So I'm perfectly happy for you just to cultivate more faith in yourself. And you can see here how the four universal archetypes work together. You know, if you can grab onto delight, which is the child, and start thinking, I just want to look for one delightful thing every day, and I'm going to write it down in a delight journal. If you can do that, which is related to your curiosity, and then you can get cl really clear about when you have allowed yourself to be sabotaged, or worse, when you sabotage your, yourself personally, and then you see where sabotage, the saboteur and the victim are kind of connected and doing a number on you. If you can decide how you're going to ward that off, you're developing some confidence and self-esteem and then you're not, you're gonna have faith in yourself. And the next step is community. 
So here are just a few other archetypes that um, I just, I love this stuff. It's like storytelling and there's a storyteller archetype. So these are just three more that are related to um, creative practice in the way that I understand it. This one is the artist. And I, I just had to include this because I wanna make sure that everyone here today understands that artistry doesn't necessarily mean you've got a canvas and a paintbrush. Artistry is choosing what color to paint your living room. Artistry is choosing how to adapt a particular recipe or use some food in some way that no, as far as you know, nobody else did and you're just gonna jump in and see. And it's ceramics and it's flower arranging. It's the clothes that you choose. So artist, if you have an artist archetype active in your life, that artist is active in every aspect of what you do. I haven't painted my dog's toenails red, but they're getting long enough that maybe I will. <laughs> and that would be the artist at work. And this one, this one blows a lot of corks. Have you ever been insulted because somebody referred to you as a dilettante? and said, when are you gonna get serious about something? You never buy, you never use the stuff you buy. Well, that's another problem. But, you know, the original root of dilettante is, is not somebody who just dabbles and is um, insignificant. A dilettante is someone who loves lots of different things and has a, just this full blown curiosity about the world around her. And so maybe she, she paints for three years and, or two months, and then she switches to knitting. She's bouncing back and forth all the time. And we have to get over thinking there's something wrong with that because there's nothing wrong with that. And this is where I have to eat a few of my own words because I spent the first 20 years of my career helping people learn to do a series and stay on track and, and focus. So it's been an interesting evolution in my own mind to recognize that sometimes that isn't the right fit for everybody. Some people wanna be just like this woman, surrounded by all kinds of things, walking into the room on any single morning and just picking up what looks good and going with it. And that is completely, it's great. The dil I know, you know, it's like, I'm not a dilettante necessarily, but I know a bunch of them and they're all fantastic people. And then there's the warrior. The warrior is fierce in her pursuit of, in this case, her creative passion. The warrior of course can be um, dedicated to all kinds of pursuits. One of the classic uh, attributes of the warrior is to always be ready to do battle, but from the light side of the warrior, not going into battle unless it's required. So having a certain discernment about that. But I would say that anyone who has been working in the art quilt or textile world for any, and I don't mean working, making money, I mean just being present, we have witnessed all kinds of warrior women artists and some men pursuing quilts and art textiles as an art form against, frankly, all kinds of odds. And the warrior can come in all shapes and sizes and genders and ages too. So the previous warrior might be more what you would expect, but this is the warrior, the face of a warrior that I really love. And a conversation on creativity wouldn't be complete without considering the judge. I've got a huge judge. I've been spending most of my <laughs> 65 years trying to figure the judge out. And the judge can be particularly problematic 
in a creative setting because we look to the left and we look to the right and we judge what we do as less than. And that only brings to mind this quote, which is not mine, that comparison is the thief of joy. The positive light lesson of the judge is discernment and fairness. And one of the best ways to think about these archetypes that I've shared with you in any of them, and there are loads of them, loads of them. But the best way to think about the lessons that they teach is to think about whether what you're saying to yourself, when you're judging yourself and you're talking to yourself, is what you're saying the equivalent of what you would say to somebody else? We're usually way harder on ourselves. We pass judgment on ourselves in ways that we would never pass judgment on other people. But it's particularly important to be in touch with that in yourself so that you can begin to dismantle that kind of conversation. Because you don't wanna bring the big hammer down on yourself when it comes to creating. So there are six strategies that we cultivate in this creative strength training community and that I cultivate in my own life. And I just wanted to finish this presentation and then we can talk by sharing those. Okay, I know it's really hard. Don't be afraid to give things away. You've got to open up some mental space, some physical space, and, you know, harnessing the ability to put things in boxes and give them to some, don't trash them, don't, don't do that, don't put them in the dump. But today, actually yesterday, Wayne took over a hundred um, fiber reactive dye pastes and crayons that we used to sell online that we can't make anymore. We just not set up for it here anymore. He took them up to a creative reuse center in Austin near where we live and donated them. And now we have room for a pullout bed so somebody could actually come and visit us. And we weren't ever gonna use any of that stuff but it's been sitting there for four years. If I wanna do dye crayons and paste, I've got the recipes, we'll make some later. Um, I once gave away a bolt of gold lame because I thought, when the hell am I ever gonna use this again? And a week later I thought, damn, I wish I had some gold lame. <laughs> so it can happen, you know? you know, but I don't think I needed a whole bolt. So don't be afraid to give things away. Make a gratitude list for the people in your life. A friend once said to me, once said to me, and English was not his first language, he said, Jane, people more important than cats. And that's true. And people are more important than things. So who haven't you thought about recently? And who do you want to share your gratitude with? especially during the pandemic, we were so separated from each other and yet so able to um, communicate through Zoom. But I've recently been in touch with my mother's only remaining sister. And those Zoom calls are so important, so important as a connection to my mother now that she has died. Um, and, you know, I used to ask myself that, would I, would I like to be doing what I'm doing right now if I knew I was gonna die on Saturday? And that's a hard way to think about it, but it could be true. So give yourself that test and make sure you're spending your time the way you wanna spend your time. And that you have told the people you love that you love them. And here's one I just picked up this week. I'm trying to start a new journal practice. I don't know how it's gonna go, it might go okay. But do at least something as often as you can, and then just let it be enough. When we're in dry spells, sometimes that's all we can do, at least something. 
And while you're doing at least something and thinking all of this over, create a vision for yourself and make it your truth. What do you believe in? What do you want to accomplish? And it doesn't have to be big, big accomplish. It could be small accomplish. It's totally up to you. Your passion is personal. And then find a community where you're welcomed and see yourself as a chosen sister to others. Most of the courses that I teach are frankly 98% women. I've loved the men who've been brave enough to join in and communicate with me. But in general, this is a, it's a women's community and it's a community of women who are often discounted because of age. And I don't want that to be true. I want there to be a bustling creative forum for women of all ages. And it's even better when it is all ages. And so see what you can find and where you will feel welcomed. And then actively pursue the cornerstones of creativity, curiosity, clarity, confidence, and community, and allow them to guide you. Recognize when you're, when you're faltering, when maybe you're, you're just stalled out, and whatever you do, send some small note to someone so that you're not completely alone and so that you can find your way back. Marilyn, please. Fabulous. It's always these, we've heard these before, and some of them, not all of them. And it's always wonderful to be reminded of these. I would like to uh, share what I decided to do this year in terms of small accomplishments. Instead of making a resolution, I made a sheet of things that I would be happy if I were accompli accomplishing during the year. And so as I make a little step toward that, I make a little check. So it's not like, you know, it's not a big thing, but at the end of the year, it'll be interesting to see where my checks were. <laughs> That's a good plan. That's a good plan. And I think starting small is the, it's not intimidating. But, or maybe was your list intimidating, but starting small made it easier? Oh, I think it, it, it what did I want to say? It's exciting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is. I feel really excited about this year, even though it's not exactly off to the start that I expected. But there's so much we can do together and raising energy together. And, the, you know, I couldn't do this kind of presentation without Zena. And knowing that there are so many of you here who are willing to even talk about all of this is just thrilling to me. So thank you, thank you, because it doesn't happen in a vacuum. And Marilyn, you're an important part of it. So thanks for that idea. Teresa, please. Yes. Hi, Jane. Um, I just have a couple of things to say. Um, first of all, I just want to tell people, new people who are thinking about joining, that this is a very safe community. Um, you, you're very um, safe in um, saying how you feel, showing your art, which is something I found difficult to do. Um, but it's a very welcoming committee. Um, a very positive, positive place where you can show your artwork, ask questions, ask for comments, and nobody tears you down. Nobody says, oh my God, what the heck did you do? You know, 
you you ask for like comments like well how can i improve this and they will give you positive feedback encouraging feedback and i just want to say also that there was someone in this in cst who many years ago i had taken um an in-person class with and she wrote me a note and she said to me she's that i cannot believe how much confidence you have gained and how much you have grown in your artwork in your self-confidence and your ability to speak out since you first started with cst and i just have to reiterate this is such a wonderful community and I i'm just so grateful to be able that I found this and that I'm able to continue with Jane and CST and all the wonderful members of CST. So I thank you. Oh, thank you, Teresa. That makes me really happy. Plus, I got to say, we, we have fun. We do. Yes, we do. <laughs> we do have fun. And, you know, all the separate little groups with different interests. And, you know, it, it's really a wonderful community. It really is. Thanks. I appreciate that vote of confidence. And I, I have to say that she was not paid to make those comments. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not paid. <laughs> but I keep growing. I keep growing and, and becoming more confident because I, I do some artwork that's no not too many people really do. So, But it's really nice to be accepted. Mm -hmm. That's the most important thing, to be accepted. You know, that's an interesting thing. I never thought about that until now, but um, is this going to be, yeah, it's going to go out into the world. I guess there's no way around it. I probably spent the first 20 years of my own career never feeling accepted anywhere because I didn't have a degree. And I had all kinds of experiences that happened to me that included um, speaking at a national conference where they forgot I was on the speaking schedule and they didn't have anybody to introduce me. And, you know, time after time. And so it's just now dawned on me from what you're saying, Teresa, that I got so tired of that. I just thought, what the hell? I'm going to create my own community. And we're not, nobody's going to get treated like that here. No. But and this is, you know, like yeah. And like I said, you know, I, I don't, it's not like I paint or do anything that not too many people know about silk fusion. So whatever group I've been in, they're like, oh, what do you do? Oh, <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> but with there, you know, I, I've presented some of my artwork and I've learned different techniques that, you know, I plan on trying to incorporate into that. And I feel that what I show is not looked down on. So that to me means more than uh, you can just imagine. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe we're just a big old bunch of rebels going for it. But thanks. Megan, it's so good to see you. Welcome. Oh, thank you, Jane. It's wonderful to be here. And I am so tickled to tell everybody, um, and Mary, I hope you don't mind, and Sophia and Mary Lynn, but I'm bringing some community with me this year from uh, previous, uh, my Friend Mary Hubbard is here somewhere. I think she is still online. Welcome, Mary. She's on the East Coast. And I think Sophia, another um, member of a, a, a fiber arts community that we were in a certificate program in 2007 and 2008. So we're convening together under this beautiful umbrella. And, and possibly Mary Lynn is in Berkeley and she may see this she may it may tickle her fancy or perhaps she'll join us later but i just want to welcome my friends and thank you jane for your incredible you're just you're the best creative mother hubbard i have ever known in my <laughs> life your skirt is very large my friend <laughs> and, oh, thanks i have a huge mother archetype <laughs> and i i couldn't pour it all out on zena or i'd smother her Exactly. So I needed to oh. needed to use it in another way, but yeah. somebody once walked past me at an art fair. Uh, gosh, then it must have been about five, and I heard her say to her friend, 
because there I was in my long skirt and my and my Birkenstocks. And this woman said, oh, God, she must be an earth mother. <laughs> uh, I was insulted at the time, but then I, I had to grow into it. Yeah. No, you, you wear it very well. Your skirt's okay. Okay. beautiful and creative. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. And welcome. Welcome to Sophia and welcome to Mary Hubbard. We've been in touch getting that all set up, so that's good. Cass, please. We're glad you're here. Thank you. I just happened to see your email today. So I haven't been part of the group. This is the first time I've entered. I'm a fiber artist. Um, I'm a rigid heddle weaver, which is different. You know, when people think of weaving, they think of floor looms. And I'm a rigid heddle, but I do use at times three heddles on my loom to create floor loom patterns. So, um, but it's a different area. One of the things that I have really helped, it's helped me as many years ago, I read a book. I don't remember what the book said. I only remember the title, but it has promoted me in my creativity. And it's called, I was feel the fear mm -hmm. and do it anyway. Uh -huh. and I think that has been, I think it was Louise Hayes, but I think that has been the motto of my life. When I start to feel that fear, because of all the archetypal um, qualities that you mentioned, and whether it's you're feeling the saboteur, whether you're feeling um, the victim, it's just sit back and you can feel the fear, but do it anyway. And I have found that when I do it anyway, things really succeed. Mm -hmm. No, I, I'm totally with you. And I'm familiar with that book too. And um... What a great way to think about it. And that I think that comes from having, uh, well, a certain sort of inner determination, but I also think that comes from being encouraged by other people. So thank you for that. And I'm glad you were here today, Cass. Martha, how are you? Hi, good. I'm so happy to be here. I can't wait. You know, it's so nice that everything is starting up. Um, and so I'm really excited for the program to start in March. I'm excited about this um, program today. And I did get your prompt cards. This might be a little 180 degrees, but I had a question because I need to go shopping to buy some of the things. And I didn't know what the spreader was that you had on there. And I wondered if it was a roller for because you have plexiglass. You have India ink. I wondered if it was a roller or I wasn't sure what to buy for that. Well, um, you could use a small paint roller that would work or you could use a small Bondo squeegee kind of thing. So there are probably a couple of different and this is actually kind of leading into the next time we get together, I'm gonna to talk about some specific things that will include the art tutorials. And um, it doesn't hurt to have two or three different ways of actually spreading out pigment or dye or whatever you're using. Um, but I'm trying to think, I, I don't know a brand, but I've got a tiny little paint roller that's probably only maybe three inches. And that's perfect for a lot of spreading on Plexi or spreading on uh, like a gel plate. Yeah, yeah. I also have, <clears throat> we sell, and you don't need the ones we sell, but we have little rubber squeegees that we sell too. But this Bondo spreader that I'm talking about, I think they sell that in a car, an automotive place, and they use it to spread out the, when they're repairing, you know, like damage on a car. Yeah, okay. I, I know nothing about that. I'll be real clear. I've never repaired a car. I did <laughs> glue my bumper back on with E6000 one time, but that was a long time ago. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> but it worked. It worked. It worked. Uh, Doreen, we're glad you're here. Hi, thanks, Jane. Um, yeah, this is my first time joining the, the Creative Strength community. I'm really excited about it. Um, I, it's, it's funny because I became aware of you through the Mid-Atlantic Fiber oh. uh, Association like four or five years ago when you, when you did the classes. And <clears throat> at the time when I was deciding what to take, I, you know, I always look and, okay, let me see the person, you know, and what is it they do and what are they about? And I checked out your 
um, your website. And at the time, it was like, I, I'm a fiber person. I weave, I spin, I use a rigid, rigid heddle too. Um, I do different things like that. But um, what drew, drew me to, I took all of your classes because I wanted to take a class from this person who talked about a community, a community of creatives. I was looking, it's like, where is this community? How do you find it, you know? But I mean, I was just, I just wanted to say how excited I am because this idea of having your tribe that you can relate to and it be a safe spot is so important to me. And it's funny because um, I'm such an introvert and it's really hard to get myself to speak up or to share anything. Um, I haven't done my little introduction yet um, on this on circle, but um, it, this lecture today, I thought one of the things that I'm feeling less than about is not having that exact thing I want to work on this year, you know? And I realized today, thank you, that I think I'm a dilettante because there are, and that's my problem. There's so many things that I love to do that it, it's, you know, I'm analysis, paralysis by analysis, like, well, I could do this, or I could do that, or I could do that, and then I don't do anything, mm -hmm. and so um, I'm hoping that, that, you know, this is a, a place where it just helps me to hone in on all those tricks, and I've been, I've been soaking up everything that you've put out there, and it's like, oh, that's good, oh, that's good, but nothing replaces just doing it, and I loved your journal, where you said, do it anyway, or um, however you put that, um, uh, you know, just just sit down and and uh, oh, at least something. Do at least something. And I thought that's it for me. I just need to do at least something. I need to soil that perfect journal. I need to sit down. It doesn't have to be right. It doesn't have to be perfect. So anyway, thank you for creating this wonderful place, and I look forward to the year. Well, it is going to be a good year, and we're really glad you're here, and. I'm designing some tutorials for the whole year in terms of what we'll do art-wise that should be helpful when it comes to just do something and also helpful when it comes to focusing on keeping something going. So maybe we've got two sides there. One is what you can do when you don't feel like doing anything. So you did a little something and the other part of it will be how to gradually move into getting that motivation to, to carry through. And hopefully our exhibitions are part of that. I mean, I, I would love for, I'd love to see the Wayne, I don't know how Wayne will feel about it, but most of the time about half of our membership participates in the online exhibitions. Wouldn't it be great if we could get that number up a little bit and get more people, more of you involved in and prepared to submit images so that we could make that catalog that's usually about an inch thick. If we could just make it that much thicker, that'd be so great. The well, you know, I think one of the things that this community is important for me is that, um, you know, accountability is big for me and structure is big for me. And it's like, okay, you know, Doreen, you, this is your opportunity for both of those, you yeah. know? Yeah. And, and, and if, you if you know that you need to do this or do that to keep up, then I will create that time. But if it's just for me, it's not important enough. Yeah. And one of the great things is that we have a focus group that'll be ongoing next year, this year, with Penny Beer as the host. And that focus group is a smaller group, but the whole point of it is accountability. Mm -hmm. And okay. I think she's re-envisioning it as something that people could drop in and out of and they don't have to commit full time. But a lot of us could use could use a, a place where we could just show up and I think they will get her to talk more about it. Um, I think in the retreat, I think she's gonna talk about how that all works, but sometimes you just need a little spur of knowing that there are people out there and they care about what you're doing and they wanna know whether you're working or not. Yeah, great, thank you. You're welcome, you're very welcome. Brenda, thanks for being patient. So the, the title of Louise Hayes's book reminds me of an Eleanor Roosevelt quote that says, do something that scares you every day. And um, I oftentimes buy a little journal that has that on the 
front and give it to friends and and they've always appreciated that and I just I wondered how many people are in the community I I just learned about this whole thing not too long ago uh most of the time we hover just a little under 300 members okay and that's why we have so many opportunities. You know, that could sound like, oh, well, I'm going to get lost in the shuffle. But the fact of it is that once, and we didn't have, I mean, we've grown, that, that's not huge growth. I'm not looking for a thousand members. I don't think that would really work for what we're doing. But I think um, we've probably doubled since the pandemic. And I think part of that is because we got smarter. Well, crap, you know, I figured out, we figured, Zena figured out, Together, we figured out Zoom, and we realized that we could have smaller groups. So the way I think of it now is like if there's a larger organization and there are these two Wednesday get-togethers every month that are 90 minutes where everybody can come, and then if you're interested in a particular thing, you can join one of the focus groups or two of them if you want to, whatever you have time for, and that way you really get to know other people on a more intimate level, and I, I, I drop in now and then and talk to... and. I try not to be a nuisance, but I drop into the focus groups and because I like to know what's going on. I mean, it, it's uh, for us, this isn't just, um, it's not a job. It, it's truly how I'm gonna spend the last hopefully 25 years of my life, mm -hmm. or at least as long as I can keep going because this has become something I care about so much and it plays such a valuable role for other people, other women, that I, I feel incredibly privileged to have, and, and to have Zena work with me is amazing. And so all of that has become something that I just, uh, I, I literally thank the divine every day. Mm -hmm for what we're, what we're able to do here and how it can touch lives and, 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 and lift people up. Mm -hmm. So for what it's worth, that's probably more than you wanted, but there it is. Oh, oh that's good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Allison, you're up Hi. late. <laughs> yes, I am up late. It'll be bedtime here soon. Um, I just wanted to say that when I first joined CST, the, the archetype stuff can can start off being a little intimidating but if you're wondering about how it works the more you learn about it the more you realize that this group of supporters travel with you as you work as a creative and the more you create the stronger those relationships become and my work has definitely become better because I now have my archetype team to lean on when I'm working so stick with the idea because it, it can seem a little overwhelming to begin with but once you get into it you begin to realize that there's a group of friends that are going to walk around the studio with you every day and that's been really really powerful for me as an artist mm -hmm. I agree and it's so interesting isn't it how we can actually start to envision them because I know another friend said to me that sometimes <laughs> her saboteur's hair is on fire and he's running around in the studio. <laughs> and I thought the, the, the more we can articulate that and give it a visual presence, the easier it is to deal with it and say, go sit down. Mm. You're bothering me right now. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, yeah, I gave mine crayons. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Barbara Doyle, it's good to see you. Oh, hello. Um, I only have number one, a word for the lady who thinks she's a dilettante. Uh, I have said this many times before, the most famous one was Da Vinci. Da Vinci did something e different every day and a lot of times never went back to projects that he had started. If he was bored, he let it go. He didn't worry about it too much. Uh, the second thing is I'm not great on the archetypes. Uh, I haven't done my homework, and I admit that, but I, there's some other things about membership in CST. Um, every once in a while, and Jane asks that we do this, if we're working on something that's really giving us problems, um, to send her pictures, and she tries to help. And I think I, in the past, have probably sent her some real goofball things. Uh, <laughs> but she's 
<laughs> she's always been kind. Uh, and she answers you right away. I mean, you're not going to wait a month to get an answer on something that's bugging you. She really, I mean, I can't imagine how busy she is, but she gets back to you, you know, quickly. And the third thing is I really push these small focus groups. Um, I belong to one this year. There were only five of us. And I think that was a perfect number. Uh, we all were very different. Um, we were always very kind, even though what each one of us was doing was completely different from the other one. And she also, uh, when you join and you see the groups that come up, if you have a wonderful idea for a group, you could contact her about it and start your own group, even if you're just a brand new member this year. Now, Jane, am I saying anything wrong? No, no, I know you. <laughs> I know there's no way I could ever script you, but you're fine. So that's all I have to say. So that's it. Oh, thanks. I, yeah, I think the focus, and that is true. And that'll all, as, as, uh, as we get a little bit closer to March, a lot of that stuff will, will come out about the focus groups and how those form. And, you know, we have a YouTube, or not YouTube, we have a, a, a Zoom uh, platform specifically for groups that that might need it and so there's a lot we do that to try to be helpful in that that particular regard so so thanks Barbara I appreciate that vote of confidence now you owe me how much do you owe me for that <laughs> I don't know we'll have to talk about that off screen two more pieces to critique how about that <laughs> Teresa, and then we, we I know we were slated for an hour. We're going to wrap it up shortly here, but I always make it a point to talk through all of the questions and the raised hands, and I'm not in any rush myself. So, Teresa, please. I just wanted to point out, you know, you had mentioned um, Wayne and and the the um, the books that he produces, you know, that that we can buy through Amazon. So I just want to say the first year that I joined, uh, the focus was on abstract art. So this behind me is a close up of the abstract piece that I submitted and it was published in the book. And I am so proud. <laughs> I am so proud. <laughs> and it's funny because I have, I'm on some, uh, I'm on my library board and I'm with another group, another group, another board, whatever. And they keep saying to me, what is that behind you? And I say, well, that is my artwork that I did in my um, my creative strength training class. And it was published and like, oh, you're published. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> so yeah, so just to let you know that, um, yeah, it's just really great to be published. And uh, it's it's great. It's great. It's really it's a good feeling. Mary, welcome. So I just want to say the dilettante um, is like a butterfly. Dilettante, maybe another word for a dilettante, is like a butterfly, like a cross-pollinator. Because it, it so reminds me of my little sister. I learned about so many things um, from the different things she was learning at her high school for creative kids. And I, um, she's still really creative. And um, anyway, and I hope to take this and we are all flowers, not weeds. There you go. I agree. I agree. Thank you, Mary. Okay. Well, thanks for a good hour. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for sticking with me to the end. And uh, obviously you're here, so you don't need to know that it is going to be recorded, but it has been recorded and it will be available and we'll send out the link and you're welcome to forward the link to anyone who you think might in, enjoy watching this. That would be, that'd be great. That'd be great. We're just trying to do our best to spread the word and make connections. And so thank you again. If you have any questions at all, you can write to me personally. And I, as Barbara said, I try to be really, I, I start getting a little nervous if I can't get everything answered in one day. So but that's just my, my uh, I don't know what side that is. We'll analyze that later. In any event, thank you. I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day and stay safe. Thank you, Jane. Be thank well. you. Okay, bye. Bye, Jane, so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.
Bye, Jane. Bye-bye.